need that you need that human touch to be motivated behind what you do. That is Matess Mystery, an associate partner over at IBM. I'm Josh Burke, your host for the Salesforce Developer Podcast. And here on the podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down and talk with Matesh about his long journey to becoming a certified technical architect. And he's going to tell you little tips and tricks and things that he learned along the way. But we'll start as we often do with his early years, starting with Salesforce. Ah, so... For me, it's been Salesforce pretty much from day one, career-wise. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I started working on the graduate program at Deloitte. This is back in 2009. And um, did a few months of Java development. So I was helping the team build a digital rights portal. And my first role involved hmm. using Java and Selenium to build unit tests, UI-driven oh. unit tests, ultimately. That's how, how things began. And very quickly, within a few months, I was like, okay, this is getting a bit boring. Is there something else I can do? And lo and behold, they actually had purchased Salesforce because they wanted to set up a community to allow for rights holders, performers, musicians uh. to be able to reclaim their money ultimately for wherever the music has been played. And this company basically did that on their behalf. So using what was then known as Salesforce portals, Mm-hmm. I we, think that's right. Yeah, so we, we built out a community in there. And my introduction to Salesforce at that point wasn't the kind of the point and clicky stuff. Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> it was, you know what, Mitesh, you know how to code. So, you know, you need, you need to do some Apex. So I was happily writing Visual Force pages and Apex code to be surfaced in the community uh, for these guys to submit their rights holder claims. Gotcha. And how would you describe your current job? My current job is totally different now, so I barely, <laughs> I barely write code these days. Um, I think, you know what, I, I like it. I do like it. I, I want to like stay close to it. But the issue I have now is too many Salesforce updates have come out that I'm not au okay fait with anymore. <laughs> that I, I might be more dangerous than useful if I start to write code again, to, to say it really <laughs> honestly. So for me, my role is mostly around design and architecture. Okay. Um, it's helping customers understand how best to use the Salesforce platform in a scalable and effective way to help deliver their core use cases. I mean, that's ultimately what I do. So it, it involves yeah, sure. knowing how they work, knowing how they roll, knowing what they want, um, uh-huh. and, and understanding Salesforce functional and technical best practices to deliver something of value for them. Got it. And let's see here. So long career, all of it in Salesforce, starting with the Visual Force days, now basically centered around technical architecture. Let's talk about that transition a little bit. Like, was there a tipping point where you're kind of doing development and then you kind of started getting more interested in broader technical architecture? Or what what kind of started to get you to transition out of just kind of pure development? Yeah, sure. That's a good good point. So I would say it's the change of jobs kicked it off, to be very honest. So at okay. Deloitte, my role was mostly kind of dev focused. I think it's I'm not going to criticize it. I think it's just down to how they're structured and what they expect people to do. When I mm. moved to Acumen Solutions, I really got to do a lot more wider scope of stuff. I think a lot of that is because the team there was a lot smaller, mm-hmm. um, which means that you got a chance to take on more responsibilities, not just you know doing stuff and being assigned tickets, but actually working with the customer, talking to them, understanding their needs, being part of like design sessions, workshops, etc. Gotcha. Um, to understand from a much wider perspective, what they want to do, building those kind of soft skills as well, mm-hmm. as well as your platform knowledge. And at that point, again, with having smaller teams, you're not just coding, you need to like build the objects in Salesforce, you need to configure a report for a customer. And mm-hmm. a lot of these things you can't just do in isolation, you need to be on the phone with them to say, right, I've done this report for you, is this okay, here's how it works. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that got me introduced to much wider um, range of the platform, let's say. Okay. And at that point, I was also starting to contribute to things like um, sales proposals, design documents, helping other people mm. with estimation. And that just broadened my horizons a lot more in terms of what my specific role was involved in doing. So that was the two, a good two and a half years there with Acumen. Um, mm-hmm. I then moved on to Cloud Sherpas, which has now become Accenture. And mm. there, I would say it was mixture, mixture of development and also architecture as well. So helping our devs. Or, get, or instructing them actually what they need to build out, uh-huh. but spending good amount of time actually understanding the existing code base as well before I can tell others, right, this is how you need to do things. Gotcha. There was still a mixture of dev and architecture in those first roles, but I'd say the tipping point 
honestly would be when I joined Salesforce. I joined as a, as a TA in Salesforce's CSG group. Okay. And my role there was pretty much no code. It was pure architecture. Mm. So okay. we always had developers who are in the in our offshore centers or via a third party company. Uh -huh. uh, and my job was to then instruct them as to what they need to build, how should they build it, etc. I wasn't expected to write much code. I did do a little bit here and there, but it was more for, for my <laughs> own learning and interest okay. um, rather than actually being told that, hey, you need to build this. <laughs> Got it. That's interesting because I feel like that tipping point is a kind of a very common one. And even outside of going all the way to sort of, you know, getting certified, do you think like there's there's career value for developers to try to lean into being more user centric and being on projects that are more user centric? I, I would say so. And it also depends a lot on where you've grown up, what regions you've begun your career in and what kind of opportunities mm -hmm. you want in the future. Like, for example, growing up in the UK and building my career in the UK, I would say are expected to take on architecture kind of level roles as you progress your career. You're not expected to be a developer the full time. And part of the reason mm. for that is that we're pretty expensive, right? As, as developers in Western markets, we may want to bill out at like whatever, between six, seven, eight hundred thousand a day, which if you're mm -hmm. offshore, it's a, it's a lot less than that. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, to be an extremely good developer locally, you're competing with everybody offshore as well at the same time. Right. So I think in the Western markets, it's probably more of a push to transition towards an architecture role. And I'd say the same for those who are in offshore markets who wish to have a more non-functional role or have more client exposure. The more you start leaning towards more architecture-based disciplines, Mm -hmm. I think that'll open doors for kind of going overseas, being more client focused and taking on those roles. So that's how I see the path shape up, whether you are in a local market or whether you're in an offshore center, uh, once you transition to uh, an overseas market. Gotcha. Yeah, I'll point listeners back to the interview with Rupesh Bhatia, where his his angle really was very focused on, you know, being an offshore developer. It's very easy to just be that guy who, you know, kind of takes a ticket, gets a ticket done, and then moves on to the next ticket. And his whole take was basically like, if you can think and act a little bit more like a consultant, that's one of the ways that you can really start to, to progress your career somewhat. That's definitely true. And the second point I'd say to that as well is, when you start going on the architecture journey and reading a lot of the Salesforce materials, which are now there, you learn a lot of things you didn't know, and that impacts how you ultimately deliver Salesforce solutions day to day. You know, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll go into it at some point, but the, the CTA journey and the learning for that taught me a hell of a lot of stuff, which I didn't have to even think about or <laughs> do hands-on on projects. I'm just like, oh, wow, I didn't know. But then right. when you actually go on the journey, like, oh, okay, this is actually super important, and I wish I knew this a few years ago. Right. So, yeah. Well, and, and on that, so and maybe it's the same answer as kind of gave before, but I know a lot of people who are, you know, have roles either in architecture or related to architecture, but being a CTA is kind of that, that like long-term goal for them. When were you like getting certified? That's my goal. That's something I'm going to get done. Okay. So it's actually started a long time ago. Um, okay. When I was at Acumen, we had, we had a guy there who, he was one of the first few people, I think, to obtain the CTA. Mm. And just hearing the word CTA, just like, wow, this is like, <laughs> these are like gold members of the Salesforce ecosystem. There's so yeah. few of them that yeah. you'd almost want to bow down and say, wow, this is, this is a Salesforce guru. You know, I need to ask him stuff. He knows, he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. That really got the ball rolling. I thought, you know, what, at some point I have to do it. So um, okay. I was pretty slow about it. So when I went to Cloud Sherpas, I didn't really actively pursue it too much um, or start studying for things. Gotcha. And what I found is just when I joined Salesforce, they released the whole Trailblazer Academy for Architects with all the kind mm. of modules you need to learn, study, et cetera, in a very nice structured format. So uh -huh. uh, that was part of it. And the second thing at Salesforce is we had the whole nine domains and nine domain badges that you had to do. Mm -hmm. So it forced you to go down a certain study route to be even okay. able to appear for the, the CTA board. So... I think when I joined Salesforce, the motivation was, let's get this done as quickly as I can now. Um, let's go on this journey and, and really make it happen. So I pretty much gave to myself two to three years to say, yep, get the head down and, and just get studying and let's, let's get this done. So first of all, I want to just put a pin in that because like when we're talking about the scope about what we're talking about today, you knew from the get-go that this was going to be a multi-year journey. Yes, absolutely. I think just just looking at the kind of materials that I had to 
learn um, uh-huh. hearing people's stories from kind of their experiences of CTA and, and how long it took them to go through it. And also the transition you need to take from, I guess, smaller projects to looking at things at a more enterprise and a holistic level. It takes some time. Mm-hmm. It's not a case of, you know, I've been doing development for two years. I can do CTA and, and just study everything and I'll appear for the exam and, and job done. It's You can't do that. You mm-hmm. need a certain level of project-based maturity just to understand holistically how things piece together to be able mm-hmm. to then deliver a good solution on your review board. And at the same time, you know, something that I firmly believe is a CTA exam. It's not just about this whole academic piece, but it's also about, right, on the day of the board, how am I coming across? Yeah. Do the do the three people sitting opposite me feel that they could easily replace themselves with me and I can do the same job as they do? And you have to give them that confidence. And mm. I, I don't think that can act, come academically. You need mm-hmm. to have done a certain role for a certain amount of time to then mm. be able to stand up confidently in front of three, let's say, grueling judges and um, <laughs> be able to defend your solution as well, confidently. Gotcha. Well, let's take a couple steps back to like, because I thought that was an interesting inflection point that the Trailblazer Academy? Is it Academy or? Uh, Trailhead, let me get you the name. It's, um, <laughs> what do they call it now? It's, uh, I wanted to think it was like Trailhead University or something like that, but there's been so many brands. <laughs> It's the technical architect trail, which they've launched, and that contains all the child trails for all, all the different domains of Salesforce that you have to learn. Okay. Well, let's let's pick up on that because that was, what are the nine domains? Like, break that down for me. Okay. So, the nine domains, it's broken down in a nice way, actually. So, it starts off with things like application architecture, where, uh-huh. you, where you look at the kind of the Salesforce object model how it's constructed, custom fields, formula fields, what kind of different types are there. And a lot of the standard declarative stuff that you would build in the Salesforce platform comes mm-hmm. under application architecture. There's then the second domain, which dives deeper into the programmatic architecture side of Salesforce. This is looking at Apex, Visual Force, Lightning, LWC, and, and all that fancy stuff that you can build to uh-huh. expand the capabilities of the Salesforce platform. We then move to Community Cloud, which is another domain that I had to study, which is, which is really cool. That was actually when Community Builder was, I think, fairly new at that time. So it was really cool that you can just drag and drop stuff on, and within two weeks, you have a customer-facing community ready. I was like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> what else? So we have integration architecture, security and SSO, sharing and visibility, then mobile. Gotcha. And I don't know if I've mentioned nine there. <laughs> that sounds about right. But so like when you're prepping for this, you're kind of prepping for it's almost like you're doing nine individual tests that all interrelate with each other when you're going to go present to the board. Yes. And there's ultimately the solution that you need to present. It covers elements from each of those nine areas. So for for example, when you're designing a data model for a particular CTA scenario, you uh-huh. need to understand the sharing implications of how your data model is designed and what, mm-hmm. is it, what does it mean from a performance perspective as well. You need to think about, are there any objects in here which are going to be large data volume? And if so, how am I going to manage that? Mm-hmm. How am I going to control access to my objects? Maybe certain users should not have access to certain bits of data, so maybe certain users should. So you need to tie in sharing and visibility into part of that. Then there may also be a need to synchronize data in an object to an external system, in which case integration. Um, architecture is relevant. So the gotcha. CTA exam itself really does bring together all of the all of the domain elements that you've studied. Got it. And walk me through like I've always felt like exam is such an like understatement <laughs> for for how I've heard the day of actually goes. Like how does the exam kind of flow? How are you presented with the problem? How long is it taking you to put that together like what's the nuts and bolts of of that actual process okay so let me just walk you through kind of what that day looks like um, when you appear for the review board so you could either have a morning or an afternoon slot firstly Uh if you have a morning slot then expect to be up at 4 or 5 a.m they'll typically start your day about 7 30 7 45 you'll start solving the case study and you have now it's now three hours that people get to solve the case study used to be two in our time oh wow Okay. And uh, I've been telling people that I coach that the extra hour is gold dust. Um, <laughs> use, use it wisely. Still try and solve it in two, but keep the hour free because you can you can use it to really enhance your solution, make sure it hangs and works. Interesting. Um, so you start off with that. Then you have a small 15, 20-minute break 
while logistics are occurring. So basically, you're, if you've done anything on paper, it's getting moved to the presentation room, your laptop, or the laptop they give you is being shifted across to there to have you ready. Hmm. And after that break, you then present. So that's a 45-minute, judges all quiet presentation. The, the funny thing is, is if, if you work at Salesforce, you probably will know one of the judges actually, which are there, but you know, you can't smile at them. They can't smile at you. They you just oh. pretend you don't know each other. Okay. So 45 minutes. Yeah. Three, three kind of cold faces just watching you saying, okay, fine. Talk, talk about your architecture. Yeah. 45 minutes of that. Then there's another 15, 20 minutes when the judges are formulating their questions and uh -huh. probably re-reviewing what you put on screen just to make sure everything is correct and what yeah. things they want to grill you on and dive deep on. Mm -hmm. And then you have the fun 45 minutes of Q&A where it can go in any direction, let's just say. <laughs> like, like I couldn't, I feel the sarcasm when you said the word fun there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it honestly can because you, okay. you, you can, if, if you, if you've got faith in your solution, you okay. will no doubt defend it quite well. Um, okay. And okay. for me, when I went for the board and I went twice, I'll be, be open about it. I went twice for my review board. So when I went the second time, I had a lot more faith in the solution I put together. I, mm -hmm. I really felt that I knew how it hung together and I'd be able to defend my choices as well when asked about it. So I was, I was comfortable at that point. But if you have any maybes or ifs about your solution, it won't take long for a judge to sniff those out. And hmm. they're going to grill you on that for a good little while till you give them an answer which they're happy with. So hmm. uh, that's typically how it goes. But what I'll say to people is it's, they're not there to fail you. They're mm -hmm. actually there to make sure you pass. So if there are kind of elements which are not clear to them or which with a little bit of change would actually work, they'll mm -hmm. try and push you in that direction to make you successful rather than to make you fail. Interesting. And I've always thought like this kind of, we'll go back to the old word, but like this kind of exam, like they're not trying to they're not like throwing knowledge based questions like, do you know the proper limits to the apex cycle that would be used here? Like they're digging into the corners of the solution you've provided and just trying to make sure that they're actually the right edges that they're looking for. That's correct. So it's, it's not a blanket knowledge test. So you'll never mm -hmm. find the judge ask you, um, at least directly, tell me the limit for the number mm -hmm. of emails you can send out at Salesforce in 24 hours. They'll not, they'll not ask you that. But if somebody has, come up with a proposal where let's say you've got a million customers and then you have a bulk, uh -huh. you have a bulk volume use case uh, uh -huh. where you need to email a million people like at any point in time and you suddenly yeah. say that the Salesforce platform will do it, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I love that specific reference being somebody who has broken an application because he thought Apex was just going to send emails out all day. <laughs> <laughs> like, like it, that's, a, that's, 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 that's the real thing. Now, also, I want to pick up on a point. This, so they provide you with a laptop. So like day of, what is your access to material? Okay, so when you're there on the laptop, you pretty much only have, in my time, it was Microsoft PowerPoint. It was installed. You have uh -huh. Google Docs, which you can write stuff in. In okay. fact, I don't think I could in my time. I might have just been Word. I think that's all we had. So it was um, PowerPoint, Word, and no internet connectivity. So pretty much no access to any materials. It's just your case study, which you have in digital form and paper form. Wow. And you have your laptop to do things in. And I think it's changed now, as far as I'm aware, because there's been virtual review boards held for the last two years since COVID-19. Oh, sure. So that has now become a little bit different, the process and, and how it can be done. There's probably more tools around how they control security and, and how the board is done. But it, certainly in my time, most candidates would do a split between PowerPoints and doing stuff on A3 sheets on paper as well. Oh, wow. Okay. So tell me a little bit more about that two to three years. Like when you're coaching people, when people are showing an interest to this, What's the time gap? Like, what's okay. the what's the sacrifices people should plan to set aside in order to get that to that day of exam? Okay, cool. That's really good. That's and definitely something that I, I should run through. So, for me, looking at my journey, it was focused firstly around going through each of the trailhead modules that have been defined for each of the Salesforce domains. So mm -hmm. there was nine domains there. I obviously knew some elements of certain things. But I literally used to open each article, read it, and then make my own revision notes in Google Drive for that particular domain. So the reason, and I'm glad I did that, the reason I did that is because I knew that for the review board, I'm going to have to treat this as like a, 
an exam in terms of what I should know. Uh -huh. And to keep memory at the top of my mind, the only way I can do it is by having condensed notes that I can easily reread at a later point in time, mm -hmm. rather than having to go through the whole set of, you know, trailhead modules, et cetera, again. So that's, that's what I did. And aggressively, I'd say I'd spent a good year at Salesforce doing that, going through the nine badges that they had. Um, and then what at Salesforce worked really well is that we were asked to present once we finished a certain domain. So for example, you studied about integration, mm. you might go off and sit the integration architecture cert. Mm -hmm. And then you had to present internally for 30 minutes on a case study around integration to mm. ensure that you actually know your stuff and it gives a judge a chance to kind of quiz you as well and make sure you know the, the areas of that domain. Because what I found is sometimes with the multiple choice exams, it's not a criticism, but sometimes <laughs> you can kind of wing it. But when you have somebody in front of you is asking you a certain question and asking to explain something, you, right. you, you can't you can't just choose option C and say, yeah, that's it. Uh, right. You need to physically explain something and it'll be very clear if you don't know something. So I think that approach at Salesforce worked brilliantly. Uh, gotcha. present, present, ultimately, you're presenting nine times before you even start doing mock exams. So mm. that approach worked really well. So yeah, for me, in terms of study, it was, it was almost one to two hours every evening going through these materials, making my notes. And that was for a solid year, I would say, just to make, just to make myself knowledge ready and not just reading stuff, but some of the uh -huh. modules make you do things. So configuring, configuring stuff on the Salesforce platform, but also there are just little things which you might want to try out. Like, for example, not many of us have been working on a project which involves single sign on, mm -hmm. but you want to be able to know how to do it ultimately to be able to talk about it on the board. So to do that, you'd then take a simple example of fine. Let me try link Facebook to my Salesforce community, mm -hmm. one use case you can try out. Or, or secondly, let me try and configure SAML-based SSO between two Salesforce orgs. And not just that, but to kind of prove the point that I know what's being passed in between those two orgs, let me open mm -hmm. up my Chrome developer tools and just see physically what's being passed from A to B. Mm. Just to confirm that the you know, training material is, is talking honest and, and things are, genuinely are passed. From, mm -hmm. from org to org. So that was really helpful. It made sure that I knew my stuff, not just from a theory perspective, but from a certain degree of practice as well. I, I can know how things work. And the likewise for integration, you know, we spoke, we speak a lot about integration patterns, how you can link SAP and Salesforce. How do you sync data between them? But people don't talk about the practical side of it to say, you're right. How will you actually ensure data is kept in sync? If something, if a sync job fails, where are you going to mm -hmm. report that? In the middleware, in Salesforce? How do, you mm -hmm. how do you rectify those situations? So that whole end-to-end -end design, you need to have done it once either on a project or at least thought about it and implemented it yourself in your org mm -hmm. to be able to then talk about it with comfort in the review board. And how, because that's a really interesting point and something that in my years of having conversations with developers kind of constantly comes up is that a lot of developers who there's a lot of developers out there who kind of, you know, they get in, they do the job, they go home and maybe they don't know Apex REST was out there simply because their job never challenged them to a point where they needed to go try to find a solution for the, like that. So how frequently was that, that you had to kind of like create that artificial version of an integration or something that didn't just, you know, kind of exist in an org and you just, just sort of had to, to recreate how a more complicated structure would actually be in place. Yeah. So there were times when it was useful to, to actually do that and understand how things can work and piece together. So thankfully mm -hmm. for me, my first project at Salesforce was an integration one. Okay. So I got to understand how I can write Apex callouts to make a callout to external service get a response. And also at that point in time, I got to understand the reason for using the Apex continuation framework mm. um, in those particular examples. So it let me implement it. So then I got to understand the practical side of it and why it's there and how it works, etc. So that from a project experience was quite useful. But at the same time, if I hadn't done that, I would have to have built some call out to some form of service or some separate Salesforce org just mm -hmm. to understand how, how that end-to-end -end integration can actually work. So it's, I think it's important to get a bit of practical experience in, in those areas, just so that they call it muscle memory, where you, mm -hmm. you have things at the top of your head because you've experienced it. And those mm -hmm. things stick with you a lot longer than just theoretical knowledge. Gotcha. Kind of going back to that theme that you need to be able to stand in front of a group of three people and confidently 
explain something potentially using a laptop that has no internet connection. Correct. So <laughs> exactly. And then all, and also at the same time, you don't know what you're going to be asked as well. Right. So right. it's, it's yeah. better to have knowledge both deeply embedded in your head and also available at the tip of your tongue so you can give the response um, when the question is asked. Okay. So you've mentioned we've got Trailhead. You said that there were some mock exams. What are some other resources that some people might want to look at before they start getting down this journey? Okay. So the good news is that today there's a lot more stuff out there than was huh. there four or five years ago. There's a lot of like public study groups. I noticed um, SIMA is one that's being run um, in EMEA. Um, mm -hmm. That's re a really popular one as far as I'm aware. There's a couple of things in the US which people have launched. Deepankar Jyoti has launched a book. Uh, Tamim Bari has launched a book which I'll talk about Salesforce architecture and, and CTA journeys. So there, there is genuinely a lot more resources out there now publicly available, yeah. apart from the Salesforce modules, to help you then skill up and, and be ready for the review board exam. Got it. How important do you think it is to find other people to help kind of go down this journey and get involved in things like study groups? I, I think it's really important. So at Salesforce, for me, it was nice to have a body of 120 CCAs who you can, <laughs> you don't, you don't, let's just say, let's be honest, you don't know everyone, but at least, at right. least having three or four that you can ask a question to sure. is super useful. And from their experience, they can, they can give you some insight into certain domains, which you may not be like skilled up on. Yeah. They can give you a good answer on that. So I had that. I wasn't part of any formal study groups. I, okay. I just leveraged on the people that I knew at Salesforce to help out. But the external study groups are going to fulfill the same thing where you can reach out to other people uh, and just learn from each other to be like, fine, how are you presenting your, your nine mm -hmm. slides? What, what are you putting in them? Mm -hmm. Or maybe if you have doubts and questions, because no doubt as you go into the study material, you're going to end up with some questions in some areas, which you're just not sure. Mm -hmm. And you just want to bounce that off somebody to say, hey, what does this mean to you? How does this work? Maybe you can just explain this to me. Mm -hmm. And when you get that explained, just like, ah, okay, that's cleared my doubts. So I think being <laughs> being part of some group is definitely useful um, in that CTA journey. So tell me about two days. First, the day you realized you hadn't passed the exam. And then second, the day that you realized you had passed the exam. Okay. Yeah. So I think that the day that I realized I hadn't passed, it wasn't, it wasn't a great day. You You feel like, hey, you know what, I've gone through two years of intense study and uh, went for the review board showed face. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think I knew, to be honest, that I'm probably not going to get through, mm -hmm. mainly because I got grilled a lot on the data model and sharing. And what I was told by my coach is that if you're grilled in those areas, mm -hmm. it's not always a good sign. Mm -hmm. Because like so, the core is probably problematic and it's hard to, to rescue out of that. Exactly. It's very difficult to then be able to either justify, defend it, or get it right. And it's, it's a domino effect where if you, mm -hmm. if you fail in this, the core domain, it, it knocks off everything else as well. So ultimately gotcha. you might, you, for example, that's why I tell people that I coach where you might know your domains really well. You might be great at integration. You might be great at SSO and that's fine. You may have presented those bits well on the board, but if you mess up your data model and get that wrong, mm -hmm. you're going to get zero marks or at least reduced marks with those sections as well, despite the fact that you actually mm. are, are good at them. So I always tell people, don't get disheartened by the way the results come because they're not a reflection of what you know, to mm. be honest. Got it. So coming back to your question, the, so yeah, it was, it was a bit of, well, it wasn't, wasn't too, too pleased with the outcome, but I think the first thing I did was reach out to find out, Hey, you know, what, where, where did I go wrong? What can I improve on? And yeah, I went and started, I got myself together, pulled the pants up, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> and started the seven month journey to to reappear for the review boards i said let's not give up let's go again i know i've learned my stuff i spent a lot of time doing it Let, there's no point giving up go again um so thankfully my wife was quite supportive she's just like you know i'm not letting you out of this journey until you pass oh. so then i was like fine i need i need to just crack on and get this done so <laughs> What did I do? I looked up all the new stuff that Salesforce had released in that time because things uh -huh. had changed. I spent a lot of time looking at things I didn't know um, that I wanted to brush up on, and that was useful. I also went through another set of mock exams, so the same ones, but just redoing it in a different way. So I changed my presentation approach and style that I was going with to mm, the review okay. board, and that definitely helped because it, I actually realized that, hey, I'm actually quick at typing stuff on a laptop compared to scribbling on paper. So I changed hmm. my approach altogether. And a combination of those things, along with just getting a bit more confidence, definitely helped me when I went to the board the second time. Nice. 
And then how did it feel the second time or the, the when you when you actually passed? Oh, it was, a, it was an awesome feeling. So I saw my phone. It's, I, I knew that within a two, three week window after the board, you get the results given to you. So I remember checking my phone almost nightly. So I woke up at, <gasps> oh, at 3 a.m. No. I saw the email. You don't, you don't see the email details. You just see the subject, oh, wow. which I don't think it tells you anything. Oh no. So I was just like, oh, I'm not sure what this is. So I, I pressed open and it's just like, you read the first few words. It's like, yes, I've passed. This is awesome. So nice. I was so cool. And you know, the interesting <laughs> thing is, so when um, the time that I passed was just when we were, we had entered um, a Netflix show called The Family Cooking Showdown. Oh. Um, so yeah, I was, on, I was on TV three years ago. <laughs> Over here. You'll find me on Netflix as well, if you have a look. Really? Yes. So a, as a result, it was literally a case of um, finishing off CCA and going straight into filming studios for a TV show. <laughs> So it was manic. It really was manic, but it was good fun nonetheless. <laughs> and that's our show. Now, that was a little bit of a spoiler because, yes, Matesha's favorite non-technical hobby has something to do with cooking. It's definitely cooking. Wow. For sure. Awesome. How, did, how did you get on a show? Oh, so this, this is, again, an interesting story. So we, um, my wife actually was running a food blog at the time. So someone reached out to her and said, hey, you know, we've got slots in this show. Do you want to take part? And we thought this is just nonsense. I mean, who the hell calls you on like a phone and, and asks you anything like this? And where did they where did they even get the numbers from? Right. So she took the call and she said, well, "I don't know, this is legit, but let's see." And anyways, two days later, the production company gave us a Skype call and, and said, "Yeah, I mean, we're, do, we're doing this show. It's it's called the BBC Family Cooking Showdown. It's a series two. We're looking for contestants. Do you want to take part?" So they kind of screened us, made sure we're like, I don't know what they actually screen, but they probably make sure you're like TV worthy or face ready. I don't know. Uh -huh. um, they, they make sure you can appear on TV and do some background checks and all those things. So they also came to her house, did some recording in her house just to get some kind of background shots of us, etc. In May or June 2018, just after finishing the review board, we were straight in recording studios in Cardiff, going through different rounds of this cooking competition. We will totally link to that show. It's on Netflix. If you want to check it out and see if Matesh and his family won the big family cooking showdown. Now, I want to thank Matesh for the great conversation and information. As always, I want to thank you for listening. If you want to learn more about this show, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. Thanks again, everybody. I'll talk to you next week. <laughs>